This is Coach Lee, and I'm going to talk to you about attachment styles and getting your ex back, and how attachment styles affect breakups. Take a quick second, click the subscribe button below so you can be notified when I have more videos like this, and be sure to hit that notification option so you can be notified immediately when I have a new video. So attachment styles often surface in my comments where people will say, what should I do if my ex is this type of attachment style? Some people will say, I've heard about attachment styles. What are they? Coach Lee, what's an attachment style? Well, you talk about attachment styles and how they relate to breakups. I have avoided, in large part, talking about attachment styles in my videos, though I have talked about it some here and there in interviews, and it does have a place. But at the same time, the reason that I have avoided talking about it is because sometimes people will latch on to that so much. They will latch on to an attachment style or a so-called combination, which can get incredibly complex and people can develop these alternating theories and try to really just go into this way too deep where they can't see the forest for the trees type of thing because of what they perceive is their partner's so-called attachment style. As far as a basic history of attachment styles, the theory was developed by Dr. John Bowlby. This was back in the late 60s into the 80s. And early on, he was kind of ostracized by the scientific and psychology community because it was a new concept. But it has become accepted as a mainstream theory in how people behave, respond to, and participate in relationships. The three attachment styles we're talking about are secure, anxious, and avoidant. Basically, a secure attachment style is where someone, especially in their upbringing when they were very young, had a secure, stable person who treated them with love, kindness, and who was a calming, reassuring, comforting, and supportive presence if there was danger or there were difficult times, grieving, death, social difficulty, poverty, they had a source in their life, usually an adult who was secure and loving to them in spite of what was going on in the world, which is a terrific thing. About half of the population could be described as having a secure attachment style. And though I wouldn't say any of them would be absolutely perfect because we are all imperfect human beings. And so all of our relationships have flaws. So no one is perfectly a secure attachment style. No one is perfectly in a relationship and never has any days of doubt or frustrations or actions that don't make any sense even to them. So we can say that somewhat loosely, that this person has a secure attachment style. And theoretically, we should all be striving to have that type of attachment style. The next type I'm going to talk about is the anxious attachment style. And usually that's when someone has been around someone else who was abusive in terms of the relationship emotionally and that kind of thing. Maybe they were neglected, especially growing up. The parent was not the parent that they should have been. And there were difficult times and this parent did not respond well and could have been abusive even physically to this person. And so they look at future relationships through the eyes of the relationships that they have experienced. They don't necessarily have as good of an example or great expectations for a relationship. They want a relationship, but they don't understand that it should be a wonderful, loving thing. And in many ways, they have been trained into suspicion. If they have a true anxious attachment style, then they're going to be expecting things to crumble beneath them at any moment. And a lot of times they will kind of become a self-fulfilling profit to themselves because if they see you doing anything that seems to look like that you aren't as fully invested in the relationship as they, then they're thinking, well, that's just what happens. This relationship is going to end. This person doesn't love me as much as I love him or her. And so he's going to betray me or she's going to betray me just like everyone else has, just like I expect. And so that's some of the anxious attachment coming out in them and that they are anxious about attaching to anyone because they expect it to fail. And then you have the avoidant attachment style which is similar in that they have experienced a toxic relationship. They have felt abused. They've felt neglected. They have felt that they were mistreated. And so their response is to avoid the relationship at all. Whereas the person who's anxious about it, a lot of times 
They can be known as the one who's too clingy. They're too needy. They need reassurance. That's what we say. And then the person who is avoidant perhaps is the opposite. They want to be strong. They want to make sure that they can be dependent of you completely because they figure you're going to leave anyway. They figure that everything ends, especially relationships. And so it's just a matter of time. And that means they will invest less or they will try to, and they will even be upset at themselves if they start investing more. They will try to pull back. And so it kind of creates this seesaw effect in that they try to pull back, but then they move forward because it's like they are over adjusting and over correcting constantly based on how they view it. And it's quite a sad thing that many of us have this in our attachment styles. And this is theoretical. It's something that's very difficult to just prove absolute with scientific method or really any kind of critical study simply because it's based on, yeah, I kind of think this, I kind of feel this. And that's a very subjective type of thing to have to measure and think about and study. But we try because we want to be successful in relationships. And of course, a lot of people self-diagnose or they diagnose their boyfriend or girlfriend or they diagnose their ex. This person is an anxious attachment style, or they will try to combine the two, or they will develop all these subcategories beneath each of them. And it can sound a little bit overkill because they use several words that require hyphens and finally get to style at the end of this long list. And it's kind of all over the place. And it can be, if you just make it too much the magnification of this topic, it can get a little silly. And so whereas I think there's value in this, I'm a believer that these things exist to strong degree. I can also tell you that too much of this is not a good thing and that it can make it to where you basically obsess. And I can tell you that there can be too much analysis of this to where we miss the big picture, primarily when it comes to the no contact rule. And a lot of times I'm asked, well, how does a no contact rule impact someone, an ex, who is an anxious attachment style? Or they will say that my ex is this, 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 this type of attachment style. How does no contact affect them? And what I can tell you, just as a big picture type of thing, is that no contact actually seems to work really well with all of them. And I know there are some coaches who say it works tremendously well with this type. It doesn't work well with this type. But a lot of that isn't even based on theory. It's not even enough to be called a theory. It's just kind of a guess. But after two decades and thousands of cases, I'm able to get a really good idea of this. And a lot of times when someone would say, I don't think no contact will work with this situation, or this person won't respond well if I just give them the breakup, I see the opposite, that it seems to work well across the board. And that's because attraction works well across the board. What I mean by that is, is that when a breakup happens, it's caused from a drop in attraction. And primarily I'm talking about emotional attraction to the point that the other person just loses motivation to be in the relationship. And that's why the confusion is, well, why won't they work on it? Why won't they put some effort into this? They just gave up. Well, that's because their motivation wasn't there. You don't want to be in a relationship with someone who you're not attracted to. And so that's why most breakups by far happen there is a drop in attraction. You actually make it worse by doing things that are unattractive because you make yourself even more unattractive. And so someone who might be on the fence about this to some degree, and usually they are, usually they are not 100% convinced that the breakup is what they want, but enough of them has wanted it for long enough that finally they find a way to go through with it. And so if at that point we do something that's continuing to be unattractive, we just give them more and more assurance that the breakup was the right decision. And they can't reach that point in the stages that an ex goes through after a breakup, if you're using no contact, to where they feel loss, they are concerned they're going to lose you, and they have to do something about it because you're just killing attraction to the point that they don't care if they lose you. And of course, the question comes up, why would they care if they lose me? Because they're the one who's breaking up with me. Yes, what I'm talking about is that they can change. You see, your goal is to change their heart and their mind to help them actually reflect on this and get a true picture of what it's like to be without you 
and to realize that they don't want to be without you. Because people change, people reflect, and get a better understanding of themselves. And that's the key, is that, yes, there there is some change, but that change is because they learn something about themselves and what's important to them. Whereas at one point, they were saying they would be with you forever. And so just like now, if you have been broken up with, that was something that changed. This can be something that changes too, and it can actually be part of the process of them really and truly learning themselves and knowing themselves so it doesn't happen in the future, which can be a terrific thing. But what I have found, generally speaking, is regardless of what their supposed attachment style is, and what's interesting is that some people can go back and forth between anxious attachment style and avoidant attachment style because it, it really stems from the same type of thing, and that is a relationship where they were not loved and valued and not respected and didn't feel wanted or didn't feel loved. And so the response can be different based on the person or even based on the status and what's going on in the relationship. So whereas someone could be anxious for a while, they could turn into an avoidant for a while. It's really more of a response. And it's really not something that you should look at as a label where he is avoidant. She is anxious. It shouldn't be that way because people change, adapt, and grow. And when you start leaning on things that basically you use to define yourself, then what happens is that you can sometimes only fuel the negatives of that. And you can use it as something that hurts you in terms of your relationship goals. Or if you start viewing your ex in this way, then you start treating them as though you expect that. And you can actually make the situation even worse. So whereas I'm not saying that it should be ignored, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have compassion to our partner. What I am saying is that we must be careful that we don't use it as a label or an excuse because usually when you do that, you don't grow and you only make things worse. For example, on a coaching call, I remember someone when I was telling them that they need to give this other person the breakup, they need to leave them alone and let them experience it so they can actually see if they want it or not. And this person said, yeah, but I'm, I'm an anxious attachment style. And I said to them, okay, so does that mean you don't want your boyfriend back? And there was a long pause, silence on the other end. And she said, well, of course I do. So I said, well, then why are you telling me that you're an anxious attachment style? What does that have to do with the situation? Because I'm telling you what gives you the best opportunity to help him to see what he really wants and to see your place in his life to reflect and to gain some understanding from this and hopefully to see that he wants to be with you and that this was a mistake. That's what the goal is. That's what your goal should be. And basically it's as though that because you were labeling yourself as an anxious attachment style, that you should be doing something different, that what works with attraction is not going to work in this situation, or that you should just give up. Because that's what I'm hearing when I say, this is what needs to be done. This is what's going to give you the best chance. And you say, oh, wait, though, I'm this type of attachment style. So be careful that it's not used as a crutch, because even if it's difficult for you, even if your goal is difficult, that doesn't change the fact that it's your goal. And of course, on the opposite side, you could say, my ex is an anxious attachment style, or my ex is an avoidant attachment style. So does no contact still work? Here is the goal with no contact. First of all, you are showing you respect yourself and that you are not going to force your way into someone's life when they have told you that you are not welcome there. That's respecting yourself. It's also respecting them because when you refuse, when you stay in the life of this person, even though they said they want to break up, you're basically saying, I know you say you want that, but I want to be with you. And that matters more than what you want. And remember, this is conceptual in the mind of your ex. They think they want the breakup. So if someone is avoidant in some ways, they could be avoiding the relationship by the breakup. But like I said, a lot of people go back and forth. There's a seesaw. And sometimes that seesaw can work in your advantage in that when they realize they could be losing you, that's when they can turn into more of an anxious type where they can, let's say that they feel the weight of that influence on them more 
and that can cause them to see your value more. But if you show respect to yourself and to this person, that's what no contact is intended to demonstrate, that you can respect yourself and you can respect this person. And interestingly enough, they're one and the same. And when you can do that, you demonstrate that you are an attractive person and attractive people attract other people, which will be clear to your ex. And that's where we can talk about them getting to a point where they can fear losing you, that they can get to a point where they start to think, you know, I'm thinking the breakup might have been a mistake. If it was, what if I can't get them back? And that's the key. And anxious or avoidant, they can both be influenced by that. Is there some degree to which no contact can work better or faster with one or the other? Sometimes, but sometimes there's not. And that's why I told you early on, it seems to work well with both. People who tell me she is an avoidant attachment style. So if I stay in no contact, if I don't contact her, she's just going to move on with her life. I wish that I had an exact number of how many times I have seen that and then it work. And the person contact me and say, I can't believe it. She's reaching out. He's reaching out. And this is going to work, it looks like. We can speak to generalities in terms of how the no contact rule can impact someone who has an attachment style of a certain kind. So for example, if you have someone who has a quote, healthy, secure attachment style, then what you're going to see is more of a slow, traditional, as far as the way I explain it, type of response to no contact. So you're talking about that 45 days that I talk about where they can reach some sort of separation anxiety level and that the odds of them deciding they need to contact you and that the two of you should get together, maybe talk about this, that maybe the breakup was a mistake and they start going through those stages. That's more of how we would see it. It would happen sort of in that timeline. Whereas someone with an anxious attachment style could reach out sooner and it could be more intense. So instead of just saying, Hey, I was wondering if you want to meet up for coffee, maybe just talk. Could we get together? They might be more likely to reach out and say, it's been a terrible mistake. Would you please take me back? I'm so sorry. And they could become very emotional. Now, what's important in that situation is that if you respond with similar emotion, if you respond too strongly, it can actually send them back the other direction because they can also become anxious in terms of trying to get out of the relationship because they feel that for whatever reason it's going to fail. And so they're trying to escape that sort of like escaping the ship before it sinks. And so if you allow them to keep coming to you, to keep moving forward, so you respond that you are open-minded, that we can talk about it, but you don't say yes, absolutely, because it can actually have the opposite effect on someone who has an anxious attachment style. If you allow them to keep moving towards you in the relationship and that they feel like there's some work to be done, that maybe they have to earn you back just a little bit. And basically you respond with openness, but not certainty that it's going to happen. That's actually better because it feels to them like things are progressing naturally and slowly and not too fast. And so they don't feel like that they are jumping right back into something that they were thinking was just going to collapse. Anyway, they trust it more when it's got a natural development cycle. Someone who is avoidant might take longer. A lot of times they are the ones who 60 days later will reach out casually. They will test the water a little bit more because this person doesn't want to make that investment and then feel like a fool. They don't want to say, you know, I've been thinking this might be a mistake. This breakup might be a mistake. And then you respond with, well, gee, I was just thinking how brilliant you were for dumping me. And they build it up to those levels that they anticipate that the person in the relationship with them is going to see them as beneath them. They're going to see them as not worth it and they're going to pull away. And so they are afraid of that and they will act that way. So they will be more casual and they will reach out calmly. They will reach out with something more casual, like how have you been? And so that's where the people who say, ignore your ex and they kind of have this broad stroke about how to do it. And you should just ignore them for who knows how long and expect they'll just keep coming at you, especially if your ex has any avoidant in them, which most of us do, the more that they have, the more that they see it this way, the more that they feel it this way, the better the chances that they will try once you ignore them. And they say, just like I thought, 
I'm beneath them. They don't want to be with me. This was destined for ruin. And you won't hear from them again because they're not going to take the rejection. They're not going to put investment in again and feel like they are rejected. And even though they're the ones who dumped you, that's how it will feel. Does it make perfect sense? It depends on what your history with relationships is. If you know what it's like to feel that way, then maybe you can see how other people might view relationships that way and be concerned and feel like that that's going to happen. And so when you ignore them, even though they broke up with you, in many ways they say, see, that's what would happen eventually. They would have broken up with me anyway, so I was right to break up. So there's value in anticipating that from someone who's avoidant, that it will be slower, that they will be more casual, that you might have to endure days or weeks of just small talk with them because they're trying to see if you still have interest or if they just totally blew it. They're trying to see if you hate them or if you're open and you don't want to move too quickly for them either because an avoidant, just like an anxious attachment, they will tend to not trust things that move too quickly because they will feel like that it's artificial or they will start to think that they are beginning to invest with more speed and they just kind of want to grab things and stop it. So they fear things in the same way from different angles, which is pretty interesting. Both of the attachment styles that are not labeled as secure, which would be anxious and avoidant, both of them need to see some progress. That's why I say, if they do say something about, would you be open to getting back together or would you want to get back together? That you say, yeah, I'm open or we can talk about it, but you don't just jump on board right away. You want them to feel solid ground and that there's solid progress being made, but that it's not so quickly that they could see things hitting a bump and the relationship could crash. That's kind of the general analogy. And so the response is actually pretty similar with both, but the expectations you should have will be different because one could respond quickly with intensity. The other will be more backed off and reserved about it. However, we also have to consider that if they know this about themselves and they've seen a pattern where they could start to feel that they want to do something or they should do something, but then they push against it, especially the anxious attachment style. So those are things to keep in mind. But just remember, your response to this is still to respect yourself and still to respect them and still to refuse to go where you're not wanted. That is how you demonstrate emotional strength and can let them see the true breakup, which is usually not what they thought it would be. It really all comes down to attraction, to where that emotional drop that caused the breakup, that emotional attraction that fell off, if that can be reclaimed, even in small degree, to get the other person at least reconsidering and reflecting, then that's where you can be successful. And the other aspect of this is, is that even if it doesn't work, you still are respecting yourself and respecting the other person by giving them the breakup they think that they want. You are kind of limited really in terms of options because if you do pursue, if you do refuse to get out of this person's life like they have requested, then you lower your attraction and that certainly doesn't help. If this person is an avoidant attachment style and you become less attractive, the odds are even less. And so in many ways, we could play the game all night and I'll even brew the coffee in terms of it could work this way. It could work that way. They're an anxious, avoidant hybrid of the third kind. If we wanted to, we could dissect it to the nth degree. But what I'm telling you is that there are much better ways to spend your effort, like making yourself better for you, like becoming stronger emotionally like working on your career, working on your health, your fitness, your relationship with your friends and family, and working on taking things one day at a time, which is actually how your brain and your emotions and your spirit were designed to operate and to absorb and to interact with the universe right here in the present, not out there in the future somewhere where you may or may not get your ex back, where something may or may not happen, where things may or may not happen like we even think that they might now. No one can truly predict the future. We can just guess. And so putting more emphasis on the present where we're actually experiencing the truth and reality of what is happening, that's where we can be our best. That's where we can be most effective in terms of helping ourselves, helping other people, 
and living the life we want to live. And that's how you can actually be much more effective in getting your ex back because anxiety, which is caused when you go way too far into the future in terms of your thinking, in terms of your processing and your concerns, that is not an attractive thing, especially when someone has broken up with you because they don't want to experience the drama. They don't want to be concerned that you might show up and make trouble for them and be emotional because at the moment they have basically become strong in the idea they want the breakup or else they wouldn't have gone through with it. And that's why you were least effective to try to do anything at the moment, except give them the breakup, show them these positive things about yourself and let them make up their own mind. I go into more of this in my emergency breakup kit and you can check it out in the description below. But just remember that while there is value in talking about attachment styles, talking about why maybe this person becomes anxious and insecure, and it's because of the relationships they experienced in the past where they felt unappreciated and unloved and unwanted, there's value in that for sure. And we are all to some degree a little bit anxious and a little bit avoidant because we have been around people who mistreated us. But the most important thing is to move forward. Looking back has some value. Staying in the present and moving forward from the present has much more value. That's how you can get your ex back, but that's also how you can be a stronger person for other things that may come at you in life. I have a video called The Psychology of the No Contact Rule that I will link to in the description below, and I encourage you to watch that video. It explains how no contact can reattract your ex and help you get your ex back and why it's so important that you do it. This has been Coach Lee, and as always, thank you for watching.